Welcome back everybody to today's episode of our Raising Special Kids Quick Connect Facebook Live Series. My name is Brittany Miller and I'm super excited to be here today. We have a really fun topic we're going to discuss. So for those just jumping on, welcome. We have been busy helping families these days, as you can imagine. I feel like every time I come on here we talk about it, but it is back to school season and so it's been our privilege for all of these families calling in to Raising Special Kids to help them with their special education and IEP questions give advice and coaching on how to work with their child's school team and more. And it's been really great to help families as they help their children have a good start to the school year. So today we thought we'd tackle um, something kind of different. So there are a lot of myths out there in the special education world and about IEPs. And honestly, parents will call us at Raising Special Kids confused about some of the things they're hearing from parents in the community or professionals are finding online and it can be tricky and unclear and you know rightly so in um, the individuals with disabilities education act idea there's a lot of legal language and it can be confusing for families and so we wanted to share what idea says about some of the most common myths we hear at raising special kids from families about special education so i have my list and we're going to tackle them together today myth number one this one actually surprises families sometimes. Medical doctors cannot prescribe special education services. So, you know, as a parent, I can see why this could be frustrating for families or a surprise. You know, having a child with a disability myself, if their medical professional says, your child would benefit, benefit from special education services, here's a prescription, and then you go to the school and that's actually not how the process works, sometimes that's surprising for families. But what actually happens is following a review of existing data and the administration of any assessments or tests the school team decides are necessary, a group of qualified professionals and the parent of the child together um, work together to determine the child's educational need and if they qualify for special education services under one of those disability categories we talked about recently in one of our last Quick Connects. And we will go ahead and put the link to the Arizona Department of Education. Um, they have a really helpful resource on their website that talks about all of these disability classifications in case you need a refresher. So please check out the comments on this Facebook Live to review those. So schools do take information from the medical provider. Say your child was diagnosed with something and you provide that diagnosis if you choose to the school team, you know, they do have to consider that information, but it doesn't determine eligibility for special education. So just remember, a medical diagnosis does not determine services. Myth number two, every student with a disability or a need gets an IEP. So a child must have all of the following to qualify for special education services under IDEA. They must have a condition that meets the Arizona defini definition of disability. Review that link from the Arizona Department of Education in the chat that goes over those. The condition must adversely affect their access to the general education curriculum. So their disability must be significant enough that it adversely affects them when they're trying to learn what their typical developing peers are learning. And because of their disability, they have a need for special education services, that specially designed instruction that is put together in the child's IEP to help them at school. So if they have a need for that, those three things would qualify them for special education services. And sometimes that's not every child if they have a disability or a medical condition. So that is a myth that we wanted to dispel as well. Myth number three, and I will tell you personally, as a family support specialist here, I've heard this one a lot. And it, it's kind of confusing because you are signing something when you attend usually. Myth number three, parents have to sign the IEP before it can be implemented. So, you know, we'll get calls from families that maybe they disagree with the individualized education program, the IEP that was created for them. And they said, well, I did sign it, so I don't approve of that. Um, and then you talk about what they should do next. Actually, according to the, our federal law, IDEA, um, there is no requirement for parents to sign that IEP. Same with the Arizona State Board of Education rules for our state. Um, Usually when you go to an IEP meeting, if they're having you sign a form, it's that attendance sheet. You know, there's all these different roles of IEP team members that must be at a meeting and a parent is one of them. And so when you're signing that, you're signing you attended the meeting, but it doesn't mean that you're signing off on the IEP. Myth number four, this one's related to myth number three. Parents have to approve an IEP before it can be implemented or, or, or started and put in place. Again, this one can be hard. 
admittedly, if a parent um, isn't comfortable or doesn't quite understand um, the plan for their child and maybe not, doesn't agree with the team. I mean, that happens sometimes. Um, however, there is no require it, requirement in our federal law that the parent has to approve of it um, before it can be implemented. So you're on the IEP team. Everyone is working together. Of course, you know, the ideal situation is for the school professionals and you to come together on an IEP everyone agrees with. But there has to be, um, if there isn't consensus, if everyone doesn't agree, which we'll talk about it in a minute, um, a district representative would be the one who makes that final say. And if that's the case, the school district does have the responsibility to provide our children with FAPE. That term you'll hear a lot, free and appropriate public education. Um, if the IEP has been created, they feel like this is providing FAPE, they can proceed in implementing the IEP, even if the parent doesn't agree with it or not. However, we have rights as parents, right? So there are procedural safeguards that we can help you with. We've talked about them previously. So if this is you and you have concerns, of course, please, please call Raising Special Kids. We'll put our information in the chat and we can kind of help you with next steps and, and what to do and how to communicate with the school team. Myth number five, having an IEP means your child will be placed in a special education classroom. This honestly is a fear for some parents, some not, but inclusion is important, um, rightly so. And so a lot of parents are afraid if their child is labeled or qualifies for an IEP that they won't be able to be in class with their typical de developing peers. However, there is a term called least restrictive environment. And federal law requires that to the most extent possible that's appropriate for this child that they're reviewing and creating an IEP for, um, as much as possible, they need time with their typical developing peers. That's appropriate for them. So that could include a regular classroom with supports. It could include a special education classroom. However, maybe they go to specials with their typical peers. It could look like a combination of that, of a resource room. So there's all these different placements um, and we can help you understand those if you have additional questions. But if your child qualifies for an IEP, it doesn't mean that automatically they're gonna be in a self-contained classroom. All of those variables are weighed individually and the IEP team has the responsibility to determine what is the least restrictive environment for this child. And that can look different for a lot of our kids. All right, I'm going down my list. Myth number seven. Ooh, myth number eight actually. <laughs> Schools have to give parents 10 days advance notice before scheduling an IEP meeting. This is actually false as well. There is no such requirement in IDEA. What it says in there, and I'm gonna read it verbatim, it says, um, a school must take steps to ensure that one or both parents of a child with a disability are present at each IEP team meeting or are afforded the opportunity to participate. Schools must notify parents of the meeting early enough to ensure that they will have an opportunity to attend and schedule a meeting at a mutually agreed upon time and place. So schools must make the effort to make it possible for that parent to be there. Um, there's no number on the advanced days of notice, but you know, reasonable times the parent can make arrangements. Um, just so you know as well, something to note, if a parent, if you request an IEP meeting in writing, you, know, you send an email to the IEP team and say you'd like to meet, the school can take up to 45 school days, not calendar days, school days, which would equate nine weeks to hold that meeting. So that doesn't always happen, but legally they have that time frame within the law. Myth number nine, IEPs have to be written by a certified special education teacher. Actually, this is false as well. So the IEP team is responsible for developing, reviewing, and revising an IEP for a child with a disability. You know, creating this individual plan that reflects the supports and services they need, the specially designed instruct instruction, the placement, you know, what type of setting they're gonna be educated in and all of that. Um, but it's not written by one person. The development of a child's IEP is a collaborative effort and it's not relevant who actually is physically writing it and records that IEP document or typing it up. It's the team that puts that plan together. Myth number 10. This one is a little tough for parents, I admit, um, but we need to talk about it. If the IEP team cannot agree or come to consensus, the parent is the one who makes the, the final decision. So this is a myth we hear a lot. If I don't agree with the IEP, they can't put it into action. If, if I don't agree on something, a related service or a goal or something in the IEP, you know, I have a parent, I am the parent, I get the final say. Unfortunately, that is incorrect. 
Um, the IEP team, of course, the goal is to work together, right? At Raising Special Kids, we preach and teach parent professional collaboration. We want you to have a good relationship with your child's school team and work together. Even still, sometimes there is disagreements. And while working together, the IEP team and the parents, they may not be able to come to consensus on something. The individual or entity that has that decision-making power to, if there isn't consensus, to bring that is the public education agency. Sometimes you'll hear it as PEA rep. That is essentially the district. So at an IEP meeting, there'll be a district representative. If the IEP team can't come to agreement, they'll help make that final say. However, remember, if you don't agree with it as a parent, you have rights, procedural safeguards. And so, of course, reach out to Raising Special Kids, talk to your school team about your concerns, and we can figure out um, the next steps and give you some guidance on that. Okay, the next myth that we hear a lot, and this one is um, really common, we usually hear this in the spring from families, they want their children to have extended school year. All children on IEPs qualify for extended school year. So this would actually be myth number 11 now, looks like we're at. Um, that is actually false as well. So when an IEP team is trying to decide if extended school year is appropriate for a child, they really think about how is the child affected on school breaks? Do they have significant regression over winter break or spring break or summer? Does it take half the quarter to get the child back to where they were before the school year ended and then back to school starting? That significant regression piece is important and IEP teams will use that information and data to determine if extended school year is appropriate for this child with an IEP. It's not summer school, it's specially designed instruction, right? It's individually um, planned and set up for that child to receive that help over the summer. If this is something you're interested in or you feel like your child needs, I would suggest you start talking to them um, after winter break. You know, have that conversation in January. Start asking the team what they think. You know, really um, think about your child's, um, how they do on these breaks. And if they're really having a hard time um, catching up or the breaks significantly affect them, extend school year or ESY may be appropriate for them. But the myth is, you know, it's not true that all children with IEPs are automatically granted that. It's definitely an individual decision like most things in the IEP process. Okay, we're getting towards the end of our myths. So number 12, changes to an IEP can be made only during the annual IEP meeting. This is a myth. So parents will call us and say, you know, we met in September, I can't make any changes until next September on my child's IEP. Well, this is actually false. Um, an IEP is a living document and it can be changed as needed. Of course, as an IEP team, you would make that decision together. But if a parent, a teacher, or other support staff feels like the accommodations or modifications need to be adjusted or changed, or maybe they're no longer helpful to the student, request an IEP meeting and talk about it, and those changes can be made. As a parent, you can request an IEP meeting at any time. Of course, we talked about the timelines the school has to make that happen, but an IEP can be edited, updated, what have you, more than annually. It's just very individualized, and you'd want to talk with the team about that. Okay, the last myth, an IEP will follow the student around forever, and I think we're at 13. Um, sometimes parents have this concern, right? You know, their children is given a diagnosis, and it can be hard for families to accept. Uh, maybe they're feeling like their child's being labeled, they don't want it to follow them to college or affect their self-esteem. You know, we recognize at Raising Special Kids that every parent handles the news of their child's disability differently, and that's okay. Um, it's not always easy to accept that. And some families are worried if their child qualifies for an IEP, it'll affect you know future, future opportunities, college, things like that. It is required by law, by IDEA, that students go through a full reevaluation every three years to determine does this child still need special education services. There are also annual IEP meetings like we talked about that can review and update the IEP. So schools are constantly, you know, every three years reevaluating and annually meeting together as a, team, as a team to determine if this child still would benefit for special education services. It does not follow a student around forever. And in fact, IEPs are not an option in college. 504 plans are, but we can talk about that on another Facebook Live. So just remember that. All in all, if you have questions about anything we talked about today or any other myths that are out there, because we know they exist, please reach out to Raising Special Kids. We'll also put a really great resource in the chat from the Arizona Department of Education on myths that they hear often. 
um, because it can be confusing, you know, all this language, this new verbiage, this sped language that we have to learn as parents who have children with IEPs and in special education can be confusing. If you need assistance, please out, reach out to Raising Special Kids. And also, lastly, please check out our trainings. We have an IEP um, training tomorrow, actually. So if you head over to our website, RaisingSpecialKids.org, look in our training section. Our fall calendar is chock full of helper trainings. They're free for families and they're very beneficial to you. You know, when you're more empowered and educated, you can advocate for your child. Um, and we're here to support you with that. So with that, if there's any other questions, reach out to Raising Special Kids and we will see you next time. Bye guys.